Yes, Mr. I appear, uh, Mr. Heal, uh, for the appellants of our Liverpool distillery, a Liverpool gin distillery in the Halewood parties. Um, my learned friend, Mr. Alexander, appears uh, with Mr. K for uh, the Sazerac parties. As you'll know, this is an appeal from the uh, trial judgment of Mr. Justice Van Court last September, in which he held two uh, trademarks, an EU mark and a UK mark, infringed or the word, uh, covering the word Eagle Rare, infringed by my client's product, the uh, American Eagle product, uh, under Section 10.2 and the equivalent EU provision. Uh, what I propose to do is just start referring to the UK Act, but I'm also talking about the EU provision unless otherwise necessary. Um, the, uh, as you will see from the appellants and respondents' notice, there are two issues which may arise for uh, Consideration: the issue of indirect confusion, uh, what it is, how it is to be assessed, uh, and did the, did the judge do that job correctly in his judgment? And then, of course, my learned friend has a respondent's notice uh, for the, um, did the judge rightly dis dismiss the claim for infringement on the 10-3 basis? Or should he have upheld it for different or additional reasons? Um, I had a, a discussion with my learned friend just before uh, court, and we were in, we're in your lordship's hands as to how to proceed here uh, in terms of uh, whether he opens it and I respond, and then he responds. Uh, that would be my preferred course, just because it's. Uh, well, that's fine. His, whatever, whatever suits counsel. I'm grateful. Lord. So um, I propose to deal with matters broadly in the order of my skeleton. So indirect confusion first, um, and then to go to context and. That's a sequence that's important because we say that the, the, the assessment of context arises out of the uh, appreciation of the matters that arise under uh, indirect confusion. Um, in effect, the point on context, looking at the learned brain skeleton, we say is actually in the end quite a short one. Uh, it doesn't look like there's much controversy on the law, uh, and there's a small point on what you can take into account properly. Um, Sorry, Mr. Malich, I do beg your pardon. Um, is there, am I right that there's a transcript of this? I believe that's right. Because right, it affects how careful a note I'm going to take of what you're saying. Grateful, yes. I don't think there's a live note. But then no, no, that's, that's fine. Thank right. you. So um, if, if I could ask my, my lords to start with, the obviously, the two trademarks yes. in, in issue. If you take uh, the core bundle uh, or the judgment, I know it, uh, it doesn't matter where, but they are at tab 10, the... the the specifications are reproduced. Tab 10, uh, page 123, uh, which, which cites the two trademarks. They are an EU mark from, 20, from 2002, the 961 mark, for the word eagle, words Eagle Red, uh, with a filing date of 1 March 2002. Uh, and it's registered for alcoholic beverages and, and a number of other things. That was uh, partially revoked on grounds of non-use down to uh, uh, that was partially revoked down to whiskey and bourbon whiskey. Uh, and the UK mark was already for whiskey. Um, the UK mark includes a disclaimer uh, that it gives no exclusive right to the use of the word rare. I'm, I'm not sure anything turns on that. And the judge didn't seem to make anything of it either. The goods, as you can see, are listed there, um, as now voted, and there's no issue in relation to those. And what I propose to do, my lords, is just sort of um, pick up on a few key points in the finding uh, and then dive straight into the issue of uh, indirect confusion. So, at paragraph seven, if you take the judgment, shall we? You will have kept your own note of the important parts, but uh, tab seven of your core bundle. At paragraph seven, there were the findings about uh, Eagle Rare and uh, it being a high quality whiskey. There's a 17 year old version and a 10 year old version, and it's an allocate on allocation whiskey, which means I think hard to get, small quantities, and so on. Um, I should say right at the outset, there's no issue on the reputation uh, that was found by the 
by the judge for the purposes of the 10 3 uh, claim. Although, obviously, we take a point. We, 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 we comment in passing that uh, this case is probably at the lower end of the range of cases that have been held to have been, uh, a reputation has been held to be established. Um, we then, at paragraph 8, the judge moves on to uh, our product, uh, American Eagle, the Tennessee straight bourbon. There's a 12-year-old, uh, an 8-year-old, and a 4-year-old. And it was the 12-year-old was launched in late February 2019. So that's the commencement date for the purposes of the trademark infringement claim. Yeah, just one small question, which I don't think matters in the least, but um, there was a pleaded claim for passing off, which is yes. nowhere referred to in the judgment, and I was just wondering what happened to that. I believe it was abandoned either on the first day of trial or during trial. Okay. So, uh, I'm not sure it made its way into the opinion. The, um, the, uh, the judge then turned to the bourbon market, and there's an important finding here about the uh, about the structure of that market that my lords will need to take account of. Uh, and again, it's not, not something we challenge, it's just for the purposes of background. Um, so the if you look at uh, 12, really 13, uh, and third line of 13, 90%, so, so American whiskey comprises about 10% of the UK retail market in whiskey, and that, so that would include Scotch and Irish. And about 90% of that 10% share is attributable to just two brands, Jack, Daniel and Jack Daniels and Jim Beam. Uh, and, and that's important because that's sort of, they're the absolute you know, biggest monster <laughs> players in this market. Uh, and, and what they do is important. Um, and that is what's sometimes called the value end, although both of them make um, higher value uh, uh, bourbons. Uh, and they compete with the supermarket owned brands there. Uh, and then there was a sort of dispute between the experts about what you call a middle category, and then there was a higher category. Um, but the, um, the short point is that uh, both, uh, all of my clients' products had at least some competitive uh, activity with the, with at least some of the demographic or market sector uh, of the claimants' brands. But uh, it's also true to say that Eagle Rare itself occupies a middle category, which is itself dominated by other brands, uh, such as Bullet, Maker's Mark, and so on. And you can see that in paragraph 15. Now, there was a little bit of dispute about uh, quite how many had been sold, um, which I don't think anything turns on that. The sales of Eagle Rare were um, at the low end, but it was uh, held to be a um, you know, high quality bourbon with a, a, um, a name that was bigger than its sales. Now, uh, American Eagle had achieved little market penetration by the time of the trial. You can see that in paragraph 22. And in that same, 23 to 24 is the point I was making earlier about the overlap, shall we say, between at least some. There's a Venn diagram. You've got some overlap in the uh, parts of the, of the product uh, sales, even though not all of them uh, are competing with against all of, the, all of the same customer. And now paragraph 25, the judge moved on to the law. I wasn't going to spend too much time on that, just to pick up on the pieces that uh, of concern. The, um, I think paragraph 28 would be the place I would just pick up the uh, well-known, well-established rather, comic enterprises factors, which have themselves been adopted from <laughs> other sources and have been uh, used in many, many judgments. Uh, this is not a complete list of principles, but it's the sort of principles that crop up in most cases. And each of them has a little bit of uh, additional uh, additional explanation in other cases and so on. One of the points uh, that we will be uh, saying, it's not 
So one point that's not here is what, what we've called in the skeleton concept, conceptual counteraction. Uh, it's not clearly uh, in here, and neither is uh, indirect confusion. But that's not, a, that's not to say that they're not valid things to say or find. It's more that uh, these are a general list of principles that have been distilled from the case law, ECJ case law information, and come up in those cases. And then what happened next was the judge uh, looked at that list, uh, moved through it, and then 29 dealt with the issue of uh, context. And uh, obviously that's uncontroversial, the test that he set out. The court must consider all the circumstances of the use of the defendant's sign that are likely to operate in the consumer's mind when it considers the impression that the sign is likely to make on them in the context in which it is used. So uh, that's the uh, spec savers test. Uh, and of course, an application of that was the uh, uh, Red Bull, where it might be that the context is important in one case and less important in another. Where you draw the line on context, there's no hard and fast rule that you, for example, take account of the stylization of the font or the label or the bottle or even signage next to it or whatever. It depends on the facts of the case, it depends on the type of case where and the context that the consumer would uh, take into account. Um, and indeed, the test itself is expressed in broad terms um, to allow judges to uh, take uh, the appropriate fact-sensitive um, view. The uh, one thing we would say about that paragraph is there's a sort of, there's a little finding right at the end that's slightly controversial. And it might be helpful if I just explain what uh, controversy is. The, um, the judge says, moreover, the trademarks and issue are word marks only, not figurative marks. So the comparative trade dress of the claimants and defendants' products are immaterial. Um, we would say that it's not really about whether they're word marks or figurative marks as such. Um, although a figurative mark, I suppose, could have a picture of the trade dress, um, which is probably what the judge meant. But uh, we say, uh, although it's right that there's no comparative exercise, I think it's a point made by my learned friend of the skeleton, uh, there's no comparative exercise. On the other hand, you obviously have to take into account the appropriate context. Uh, and so to the extent trade dress may come in in that way, uh, it comes up. But yes, uh, we do agree that uh, you don't take into account for the reasons set out in at least two court of appeal judgments, the mayor and ASOS case and uh, Scrabble case, you, you don't take into account my learned friend's client's trade dress. So um, next we had uh, uh, the familiar uh, principles on reputation. 32, 34 to 36 is an analysis for the, of the relevant public. That's also relevant to the reputation point. Uh, and paragraph 40 there's the uh, law on extended, what, what may be called extended infringement or extended liability. So you've got dilution, detriment, tarnishing. And two of those were an issue, the unfair advantage, uh, dilution, and uh, sorry, just those two, uh, dilution and unfair advantage. Now, he then moves into some findings of fact that I just wanted to pay a little bit closer attention to. They, they arise on the appeal. Uh, 47. Uh, he notes the importance of the average consumer. And he, we say, very much grounds the average consumer in the real world. Uh, so it's a notional objective inquiry, but directed to the actual experiences that consumers have, visually, orally, and conceptually. And you can see that from about the last half of 47. Visual, oral, and conceptual similarity and distinctiveness are all in play. It's important to consider this in this context what idea or image the names conjure up in the mind of the average consumer, what associations they have, how they sound when used in the context in which the average consumer might encounter their use, shops, bars, restaurants, or clubs, how they, in conversation, how they appear visually, though not on the stylized form of a bottle of Eagle Red. So there, uh, agree with that last part. So, uh, that's the first example, but you can see another example of him doing the same thing in paragraph 48. And again, it's the last sort of three and a half lines of that. It's necessary to have regard to the range of circumstances 
in which the purchase of bourbon whiskey is likely to take place. Much entry-level bourbon will be bought in supermarkets and pubs and clubs, higher quality products in restaurants and bars off licenses or online. So uh, that is, he, he's, he's, it's a notional exercise, but it's grounded in the real world and what actually is happening. Paragraph 52 and 53 deal with the level of knowledge and care of the average consumer. Uh, and he, uh, the judge uh, summarizes the expert evidence. Um, and the judge noted that uh, uh, th this was a, 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 there was a small debate about the level of attention and care and so on. Uh, and uh, the judge took the view in uh, that and in 55 and 56, just to move forward, at the end of 56, his final analysis was that there's a greater than usual degree of brand loyalty within the bourbon market. And so on average, the consumer has a somewhat higher degree of attentiveness than a consumer of certain other spirits. Uh, and we, we get that from uh, the previous two paragraphs. And there's some discussion of some uh, knowledge and care and, and attention loyalty. We then get into the assessment on section 10.2, so the uh, findings of, it, of uh, direct and indirect infringement at 59. And um, it, the judge starts at 59 with, uh, by emphasizing that the trademarks are two word marks. They're not for the word eagle as such. That's not to treat the mark as if it were eagle rather than eagle rare but only to observe that the average consumer would regard the word eagle as the more distinctive component and the word rare as relating to the quality of the product. Um, that's, that's important, we say, because obviously this is a registration which has been placed on the register with, it, it, with two words, and that's also the, uh, the name on the product. So uh, that's not to say that you can't have distinctive or dominant parts, but you, you do have to take account of both. Um, and then the, uh, at 60, he does the same with American Eagle in terms of analyzing that. It includes the word eagle, but as the second rather than the lead term. And that eagle is qualified by an adjective American. Now, there was a dispute between the parties as to the significance of American. Is it a descriptive and therefore less important characteristic? Or is it, uh, in, uh, is it dominant, because it's in the first position, uh, there being some uh, rule of thumb that if, in general, uh, people read from left to right, and, uh, uh, and so words, words at the beginning are more important. Um, the judge held that the word American is strong, also strong, much stronger than rare, so that the sign would be more naturally read as a composite whole. So it's American Eagle. That is because the two words are more naturally linked than the words eagle rare when read in that order. The word American has additional visibility because it comes first, uh, and uh, he rejects the claimant's argument to the contrary. Uh, it's also important, we say, uh, his, his conceptual analysis is, is, is quite important, 61. Conceptually, the sign American Eagle conjures up an image distinct from something or anything American and an eagle. In other words, individually. Uh, it conjures up the image of a bald eagle, a particular type of eagle native to North America and an iconic symbol in the national bird of the United States. Um, we say that's absolutely right. Uh, it looks like the sort of, you know, the presidential seal, or the great seal, I think it's called strictly. Um, a, as an eagle, it, it's it's uh, well, th th there's a small spat about whether it looks like uh, the claimant's eagle. Um, when you say looks like, I take it you're referring to the logo on the bottle. Yes, yes. The as distinct from the words. Yes, American. yes, exactly right. Yes, I apologise. Yes, my lord. Yes, exactly right. That's reinforced. So. So American eagle. Whereas here, I think the judge is referring to the concept rather <coughs> than any particular visual image. Yes, that's right. That's actually right, my lord. Yes, quite right. It conjures up. It conjures up the image of, yes. of the bald eagle, yes. which could be configured anyway. That's true. That's true. Um, 
So he's dealing with the conceptual, um, uh, the, the image that's conjured up by the, uh, by the, by the words. And he then uh, um, finds that uh, conceptually the trademark and the sign are distinct and not strongly similar. So that's, we say, quite important when you look at uh, the overall picture. He deals with oral similarity. He finds that there's some, but somewhat less than the visual. It's a little bit difficult to trace where he's dealing with visual, oral, and conceptual. Sometimes uh, uh, fact finders put a heading there. It looks like 60 appears to have been the visual, uh, 61 the conceptual, and 62 the oral. Um, but I might be, uh, that, that they might have been not quite so clearly separated. In any event, he considered them. And he finds at 63 a significant but not overwhelming degree of similarity overall. Um, and he postulates that if uh, the defendant's sign were something like New Eagle or Eagle Special, there would have been more similarity. So he's really saying the American Eagle composite unit and the strength of the American element uh, make, it, uh, make, it a, make it a better case from the defendant's point of view than those examples. Now, just pausing there for a moment, he, the judge didn't cite, and I mentioned uh, a few moments ago, he didn't cite a, a well-known line of case law uh, called, uh, uh, based, based on what, what concept called conceptual counteraction. Um, the idea being that uh, where you have, you could even have quite strong visual and oral similarity, but if the difference is noticed, that and it, has, it leads to the perception of a very different meaning, or a strikingly different meaning, that can counteract uh, <coughs> the other two. I mean, it, it all depends on the cases, but on the particular facts of the case. But, but we say that this was uh, effectively <coughs> a conceptual counteraction case of that sort. Now, 66 is his finding on direct confusion. Um, I want to make it clear, my lord, that uh, we don't suggest that it wasn't open to him to reach a finding on indirect confusion, because he uh, found in our favor on direct lack of direct confusion. Um, but it's worth looking at his reasons, because those then um, obviously need to be uh, considered for consistency reasons against the finding on indirect. So at 66, um, essentially, his key reasons are the strength and image of American Eagle, so it's a strong composite sign, which makes a conceptual difference, and the uh, nature of the average consumer. He doubts that a significant proportion would be confused, the degree of attention, uh, the, strength of, the strength and image of the name American Eagle, which is conceptual. Now, he then does go on in 67 to find a calling to mind. So, uh, my lords will know that there's sort of a, that's the starting point for any connection between the uh, two, between two signs. That's not enough for the purposes of confusion, but it may be enough for the purposes of 10.3 uh, extended infringement, provided the other requirements are made out. Um, but he does find that there in 67, and essentially because there was no other uh, significant or any uh, uh, bourbon on the market with the eagle in their name. At 69, we come to the, uh, sorry, at 60, yes, 69, we come straight to the issue of brand extension in the whiskey and bourbon market. And indeed, he opens that paragraph by referring to the expert. Um, and neither had addressed brand extensions in their reports. Uh, and he says they were not asked specifically to do so. Um, however, we say if, if it were relevant, they perhaps ought to have been. Um, I should say it's not specifically part of a pleaded case. Uh, all the list of issues, uh, and the judge goes on to consider it, it was the subject of cross-examination, and I'll uh, show you that very briefly. He holds it to be a common, very common practice in the whiskey and bourbon market 
and he raises the issue, the judge raises the issue of uh, uh, the Gentleman Jack and Winter Jack, variations of the Jack Daniels brand, and the famous grouse, stow grouse, black grouse variation. He cites uh, Mr. Stevenson's evidence. And he concludes 69 by noting that the American Eagle bottles don't, of course, use the name Eagle Rare anywhere on the bottle. And he finds the case on indirect confusion to be made out in paragraph 70 and 71. Uh, 71, it's common and well known in the spirits market in the UK and EU, uh, including respective bourbon submarkets for producers not only to have different expressions, and I'll, I'll come back to some of the terminology used here, um, different expressions of brands, uh, and to release different products with different names that may or may not allude directly or indirectly to another brand, which are made in the same distillery, by the same distiller, or in the same group, or licensed by the originating distiller. Uh, he refers to Mr. Stevenson evidence, uh, Stevenson's cross-examination, he referred to the presence of the senior brand name on the bottle somewhere, but he was answering a question about how different expressions uh, of the same brand were presented, doing so by reference to ex actual examples in the documentary evidence. And the judge uh, limits the effect of that by saying, I didn't take his comment to be to the effect that all sub brands or connected brands include on the label a reference to the main brand. Uh, and he would, in any event, the judge uh, says that. Uh, the consumer wouldn't have that expectation or scrutinize the bottle. Now, um, we will have to look just briefly at a, a short passage of cross-examination. Obviously hesitant to do so, but uh, we say it, it, it isn't right. Uh, but it may not matter, because we say we have a point of principle there that uh, one needs evidence. One needs actual evidence, not uh, not, not what was said in cross-examination. One needs documentary evidence. One needs I'm evidence. sorry. So I, I don't quite follow oh, that submission. Yeah. Can you say it again? <laughs> yes. I, was, I didn't mean to suggest that what he said in cross-examination was not evidence. Um, one needs uh, firmer evidence of what, uh, what one is dealing with in terms of brand practice. Uh, we say, oh, for reasons I'll develop in a moment, the well, way... First of all, why is evidence required at all? Why is not a judge trying a trademark case entitled to rely upon his or her own experience of the market? Lord, there may be uh, some products and some brands in some cases where that is so. Um, but where one is dealing, and I, I'll develop this a little bit uh, more in a moment, where one is dealing with a product market where it is said there is a general practice or even a prevalent practice of uh, varying a house name or brand to connote spin-off brands, that's an evidence-specific inquiry, not dissimilar to many questions in trademarks that do require evidence. Of course, my lord, Many questions can be dealt with by the judge's experience in trademarks. We don't shrink from that. But this is something that we say has to be. It's a bit like reputation or enhanced distinctive character or genuine use. Some of these things have to be dealt with in terms of uh, real evidence. Um, I'll, I'll, as I say, I'll, I'll develop that in a moment. Just, just I'll, I'll, I'll complete the um, uh, passage through the, through the judgment. So. The judge finds that it's common and well known, but he does rely on evidence. So he doesn't purport to rely on his own experience as an experienced drinker or as an ordinary member of the public. The judge relies specifically on uh, the evidence given here. And, and 73 and 74 are probably the key passages for the purposes of my appeal, because uh, the judge finds it common for connected brands to have similar names. Uh, and we say this brings in another important uh, strut to his uh, finding in direct confusion. He brings in the relevance of um, the cross-examination of uh, the claim
claimant's expert on uh, whether yellow rose is similar to four roses, heaven's door similar to heaven hill. Uh, and he says uh, eagle and eagle rare and American eagle are similar. Uh, and uh, th therefore there would be confusion in that passage. Um, and he says that this is despite the fact that American Eagle has a strong composite identity. Now, that also we take a little bit of issue with. Again, I don't want to suggest that a judge can't re reach quite different fi divergent findings on these two things. But it is odd, we say, that the strong composite image uh, was sufficient to rule out direct confusion. But when it came to indirect confusion, it was simply, there was no reasoning given. It was just notwithstanding that. Um, if one imagines. Um, spin-off product of a large brand owner, um, surely they would not wish to conceptually counteract. But um, again, I don't want to erect to, uh, any barrier there. Uh, but it wasn't clear uh, why that was considered unimportant for this head. So at 75, he pos uh, the judge deals with a, a prospective argument at the end of, uh, and, and it's fair to say there was evidence that the four-year-old would be, the four-year-old American Eagle was going to be the main product in due course and would be competing principally in the mass market. Um, and the judge took that sort of future uh, prospect into account, and we've got a point on that. So basically at 78, he finds likelihood of confusion on the indirect basis. Uh, sorry, 70, yes, uh, 77, yes, okay. and then at uh, 80 to 81, he turns to the 10-3 issues, 80 rather, deals with the reputation, there's no controversy about that, uh, although as I say, we, it, we say it's pretty much testing the lower limits of that, he spent 10,000 uh, on advertising and fairly modest sales, mainly word of mouth, that's not to say it's challenged, but it's obviously a point that may come in um, when it comes to my learned friends uh, in effect cross appeal on this. Um, and he finds that American Eagle does get an advantage, but that it's not unfair. 94, he notes that the case was put on the basis of subjective intention, which he finds not being made out. A recklessness also. Uh, because he says it wasn't put in cross-examination. Uh, and then at 97 to 99, he reaches some findings which are relevant uh, to the 10-3 position on my own friend's appeal before concluding in paragraph 100 uh, that, uh, that uh, there were there was no intentionally seeking to take advantage of the claimant's marks, um, but he was, Mr. Hainsworth was aware of any association with Eagle Rare could do the defendants no harm. And he do not, I do not find he was reckless in failing to carry out other searches, but that he was reckless in failing to consider whether the use of the sign would take advantage or be detrimental to the marks and reckless to the, list of, to the risk of litigation ensuing. So 107 to he finds the advantage but not unfair. And 111 to 115, no dilution. Well, Lord, that's, um, I apologize for the length of that, but I thought it may be helpful for you to just to sort of see where we were coming at uh, the decision from and hopefully pick up on some points that I'll be able to save time on uh, now. We say uh, the first aspect to our appeal is, uh, is this. We say, the judge based his conclusions on indirect confusion, essentially on what experts had to say about what was out there in the trade, which was not either supported by the documents that were put to them, or in any event supported by evidence at all. Uh, and this was, uh, uh, we say, a, a serious problem because the judge essentially had two bases for his findings on indirect confusion. He didn't consider himself able to simply decide the matter for himself. And, and he 
he specifically relied upon two, uh, two strands. First of all, what was said about uh, brand extensions and cross-examination by Mr. Stevenson and what was put to him. And secondly, what, was, uh, what came out of the cross-examination of Mr. Allenson, the uh, claimant's expert, relating to four roses, yellow roses, Heaven Hill, Heaven's Door. And that's pretty much it for, the, for this as a, as a basis. Uh, we say <coughs> once he had done that, uh, at the very least, even if he were to rely legitimately on that material, he didn't take into account what it showed. So we say he was wrong to take it into account. But if he was going to take it into account, then at least take into account what it showed. Now, my learned friend will say uh, consumers don't know the details of uh, uh, branding practice. But it, it's a difficult submission, we say, because you can't at the same time rely on a spin-off practice and then ignore the what the material shows and how it works. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly explain how it does in a moment. But, but we say consumers might not know the intricacies, and they might not know every, every product. But uh, in my submission, it isn't difficult see what it shows. And now he, uh, the, the judge ought to have taken into account context, and in particular, whether our, uh, our name in context was uh, properly to be considered a, uh, a spin-off brand or a varied, varied house brand type of case. And he also uh, based his finding just at the end of that section on confusion, on effectively on reverse or wrong way around confusion in the future. So, my Lord, let me just um, open then the issues on indirect confusion. First of all, uh, what is it? Um, my, my Lords will have seen from the Comic Enterprises case. I wonder if uh, we probably don't need to turn it up because we just looked at it in the judgment. But this, it's the list of factors from the Court of Appeal, uh, and the judge cited those factors. For your note, it's tab ten. Bundle two of the authorities, page 456, is the judgment uh, and that, that particular passage, uh, Kitchen LJ. And uh, from that uh, list of factors at K, the judge develops this point, uh, uh, what it is, the, uh, the, the, the indirect confusion. And the, the sort of most well-known explanation of it which has been repeated by numerous uh, hearing officers in the Trademarks Registry and judges, is uh, Bundle 3, Tab 15, the authorities, um, LA Sugar and Backbeat, page 811. does a word search for it. Well, to be clear, 16 and 17, I take it, you're referring to. Yes. Uh, I think I'm, I, I start at 16, exactly so, 8.20 8 and then 8.21. Um, and uh, one doesn't need to look at the, sorry, exactly 8. Just, just make sure. Yeah, so we This is the cheeky Indian. I think you're in the wrong place in the bundle. I've got the wrong place. I'm it's tab 15, 15, page 811, as you rightly told us earlier. Yes. Yes. Um, now, the explanation of what direct and indirect confusion are is not always consistent in the case law, but it's broadly consistent. Um, and Mr. Purvis here, sitting as the appointed person, says they both involve mistakes, but they are different in the sense direct confusion involves no process of reasoning. It's a sort of intuitive, simple matter of mistaking one mark for another. 
Um, indirect confusion, on the other hand, only arises where the consumer has actually recognised that the later mark is different from the earlier mark. It therefore requires a mental process of some kind on the part of the consumer when he sees the mark, uh, which may be conscious or subconscious. Um, the later mark is different, but it has something in common. And then Mr Purvis's non-exhaustive category are 17, uh, where he gives a uh, common element may be strikingly distinctive, uh, so that only the brand owner would be using that, Tesco, Starbucks, or whatever. And then B, where the later mark simply adds a non-distinctive element, pretty much anything, if you add light or express, mini, and so on. And then um, the one that I slightly struggle with, just because it's a, it's a strange example, um, where the earlier mark comprises a number of elements and a change of one element appears entirely logical and consistent with a brand extension, fat face to brat face. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure I understand quite how that's entirely logical and consistent with a brand extension, but the point is, the point is there. Um, the present case uh, the, the court, the, the judge goes on to deal with, uh, is not really of concern to us. But I wanted to show, uh, my lords, the uh, bundle three, tab 16, the one I was mistakenly looking at earlier by um, Mr. Meller, as he then was, sitting as uh, an appointed person. And uh, he puts, uh, makes certain observations on that, paragraph 16, page 820. It's not, a uh, finding of indirect confusion is not a consolation prize for those who fail to establish a likelihood of direct confusion should be kept in mind that the differences which mean that one mark would not be mistaken for another might well dispel indirect confusion as well. Uh, second, if the differences between the marks are such that there's no likelihood of direct confusion, one needs a reasonably special set of circumstances for a finding of indirect confusion. And this is what Mr. Purvis was pointing out in those paragraphs in Ellen Sugar. Third, when finding a likelihood of indirect confusion, in my view, it's necessary to be specific as to the mental process involved on the part of the average consumer. Uh, while the categories of case where indirect confusion may be found is not closed, Mr. Purvis's three categories are distinct, each reflecting a slightly different thought process. Uh, and obviously, that's right. Um, the, uh, there's a little bit of um, tension, we would say, no more than that, uh, uh, between the appointed persons, and I think there's, there's been other decisions as well, as to the uh, degree of mental process involved, or whether it's both, all of them are pretty intuitive. Um, I would just go back to the point that I made um, in answer to my Lord, Lord Justice Arnold, that this sort of assessment is more likely to be evidence-based than a an intuitive direct confusion, because subject to if one thinks about cases that are, uh, I'm thinking of the ones my Lord has decided, something like um, um, Enterprise and Europe Car, if that's a direct confusion case, my Lord can decide that, not based on the evidence, but based on his own view, uh, and find there's infringement because stressed out travellers getting off the planes might not, you know, might get on the wrong bus or whatever it was. And in a case like Fidelity, where the average consumer would pay a great degree of care and attention, uh, fidelity and fidelis, signs that my lord says were close, but uh, no confusion because of the nature of the transaction and the nature of the care and attention. Those direct confusion cases are, we say, much more about an assessment of evidence against the judge's own uh, view. But a, a uh, Finding of indirect confusion based upon branding practice may not be. I say may because it may be as well. It may also be possible for a judge to decide uh, that, and indeed hearing officers routinely do, uh, and there's no particular requirement that they have evidence in every case. But it does depend because one needs, as I, as I adumbrated earlier, one needs at least some idea of the prevalence of the practice and also the form of the practice. It isn't a binary question. Is there a practice of this sort of spin-off activity or not? 
Um, because, of course, the ultimate question is, does it affect the average consumer's perception? And that can only be if there is at least a prevalent form. Now, we say um, there's a question that comes in just before that, which may occur to my lords when they write their judgment, uh, which is the sort of tension that I pointed out a moment ago, uh, whether it needs a reasonably special set of circumstances. So should we be adding, should my laws be adding a, an L to the, to the list that um, here, you know, that, that should be a, a checklist, that should be considered in every case? Um, we don't. Sorry, what's your suggestion? My I suggestion is... I follow that. Sorry. So the, um, the suggestion by Mr. Meller in uh, the Cheeky Indian case is that it's, a, it's really for special cases, the, the indirect confusion uh, scenario, um, and that it shouldn't that uh, you don't sort of add it in every case as something you need to consider. I know some of that is as a result of the way that the registry decides things. You know, they've got a certain a formula that gets followed. We're not contending that it needs to be considered in every case, um, nor are we contending that it should not be uh, considered <laughs> unless the case is special. Um, we, don't, we don't suggest that the judge was not entitled to consider he was fully entitled to consider it uh, in this particular case. And we don't consider that an issue of principle arises as to whether uh, judges should or should not be considering it as a matter of course. We say um, a case will suggest itself to the court. Uh, and uh, it, they should, judges, or first instance tribunal should not be um, either bound to consider it or not. So we say, if you go back to paragraph 66 of the judgment, which takes away for a moment. take 66 as a starting point. The first point we make is that because the judge found no direct confusion, because for the reasons I gave before about loyalty of consumers and higher interest and attention, and he did so on the basis of conceptually different, conceptual counteraction, the strong American eagle unit and so on. It was important, we say, to um, explain why a divergent finding would be reached on indirect. I'm not saying it wasn't open to him, but one sort of needed at least some understanding of that. Um, now, the reason I say that is because I wanted to show my lords one because conceptual counteraction has sort of fallen off the radar a little bit. I wanted to show my lords one conceptual what counteraction. What do you mean by that? Well, because it's, it, it's, it's been a string of Court of Justice yes. authorities on that topic. Yes. Um, the most recent one was, I think, last year, possibly even this year. I'm great for my lord. I, I'm not, I, I hadn't spotted it. it. It seemed to have been a point that came up so, so often, uh, and I was, uh, I'm grateful for my lord's uh, um, guidance on that. Um, it may help to look at, I think, the, one of the original ones. Bundle three of the authorities, tab 20, which is the Picasso Picaro case. Now, um, if you look at page uh, 86. Or that's your, unfortunately, this is not a head noted one. Um, the Picasso estate, who I think also uh, were licensing their mark, um, opposed the mark Picaro uh, by the applicant for, for, for trademark there. And the um, court held that there was visual similarity because of the beginning and ending uh, syllables um, and some oral similarity. But at page five, uh, 867, 868, paragraph 
55 over the page, from the conceptual point of view, this, the word sign Picasso is particularly well known to the relevant public as being the name of the famous painter. The word sign Picasso may be understood by sp Spanish speaking persons as referring to a, to a character in Spanish literature. The signs are thus not similar from a conceptual point of view. And 56, the, um, such conceptual differences can, in certain circumstances, counteract the visual and phonetic similarity between the signs concerned. It's sort of a trump card on one of the, one of the um, perspectives in confusion. So having, he, he didn't cite that, and I'm not uh, saying it was an error that he didn't. Uh, but um, given that he had effectively found that basis, in this case we say, um, it was important to uh, at least contextualize his findings and perhaps even explain his findings, uh, divergent findings, on indirect confusion, just so that it could be understood uh, how and why they were different. Now, as to the loyal brand consumer, this, um, we say, was a bit of an oddity in the judgment because, and it does have significance for one of his key findings, because he uh, took the, defined the consumer as being different in, its, in his level of care and attention, his or her level of care and attention, than other spirits when it came to the definition of the average consumer. Uh, but for, as we'll see later on, he did take into account um, famous grouse. Scotch whiskey. Uh, we don't say he wasn't entitled to, but if that was going to be the key evidence, uh, then he ought to, the judge ought to have been uh, more sceptical about that um, as to its relevance in this particular market. So, really, this, the key criticism that we have on the uh, indirect confusion case is that it ought to have been uh, evidence-based and when I say evidence-based, more than simply a, a document shown to a, a, an expert in cross-examination. Now, sometimes we say that would be fine if the... Um, well, I, I'm still struggling with what your proposition of law is here, because there was no obligation on either party to put any expert evidence before the judge at all was done by agreement, yeah. and we can discuss, if need be, the extent to which the evidence adduced was actually admissible. Um, but what I'm struggling with at the moment is why you say evidence is required, expert evidence is required at all. Well, Lord, we don't say expert evidence is required, and in fact, in this instance, so there are two struts to the judge's finding on indirect confusion. First of them, well, there's two and a half. There's the prospective future indirect reverse confusion. But the first strut is the experts accepted there was a practice of brand extension. And that, what, that showed uh, a practice that was relevant to the judge's decision. All right. but but. Again, we all know that brand extension is a common phenomenon in many, many areas of commerce. Yep. Um, now, if it was going to be suggested that the Burma market was different yep. in that nobody ever did it, then I could understand the submission that that might be something required specific evidence. But if it simply follows the common commercial pattern, why is evidence required? Uh, I am going to suggest that it's different and specific. I am going to suggest that you've always got to look at the form of the uh, brand extension. Because, for example, it might be the case that in some uh, areas of trade, like clothing, for example, you might see brand variation or brand extension operate in a different way from uh, other areas. So, for example, you know, pharmaceuticals, which might have 
different kinds of practices when it comes to naming. And that is certainly not a situation that a judge can just simply go evidence-free. I don't say that he requires expert evidence. In fact, on the contrary, he probably requires trade witness evidence, the sort of thing that um, Justice Burse was dealing in, with in the Rihanna case, um, or uh, as was in the Glaxo case as well. Because what a wit trade witness is doing there is putting before the court material that will inform the court's decision as to this practice and the prevalence of the practice. Lord, as a, as a point of principle, can I put it, I've mentioned this in the skeleton, and I, I, I don't know um, how far it, it, I need to go with it, but if you think about the um, requirements in uh, trademarks law for a, to establish a family of brands, a family mark, we say that sheds a little bit of light, because what the Court of Justice says when they in the El Ponte Financiario case, which my Lord cited in the W3 Easy Group case, which I'll, I'll come to if necessary. But we say that if the Court of Justice is saying you can't simply have a family of trademarks sitting on the register and then assert that this new owner, this new defendant comes within the family, even though it doesn't match That's any for a particular completely different one. reason, namely the state of the register doesn't affect the it public does. mind. Uh, quite. And why does it affect, the, what does affect the public mind? What's on the market? You've got to show use. Now, that's in relation to a trademark proprietor who is trying to show its own effective practice of brand extension. Um, we would say, if anything, it's our fortiori, the position when it comes to third party practice. You've got to show something. I'm not saying, my lord, I'm not trying to be difficult about the level of evidence, because as I say, we say the evidence actually that came in supports us. But we do suggest that this, in this case, the point was not pleaded. It was not in the list of issues. It wasn't in the expert evidence. And then it comes in, sorry, in the report. And then it comes in, in re-examination. Largely. So there's a bit in cross examination and then a bit in re examination of our expert after the claimant's expert sat down. Or, sorry, not sat down, left the box. So uh, it didn't come in in the happiest way, and this is a specific market. Now, well, can I just explain? It may be best just to have a look at the examples of um, what I'm talking about and why we say it's a bit different from other markets. If you take, um, please, the supplemental bundle, and uh, please take tab two. What you'll see is um, the uh, these are the two big brands, that the 90% of bourbon are these two tabs, three and tab four, Jack Daniels, Jim Beam. So we've got a website, and this material was put to the, to the witnesses. And my lords, it may be helpful if I just explain, as I said, the terminology. Um, we say that there are three material categories of brand extension, so to speak. Probably two, but if to, for completeness, three. I should say these are my categories for the forensic purposes. These are not sort of expert accepted categories. Because of course, they didn't address it in, the, in, the, in their evidence. So category one, and I'll show my Lord's examples. Category one are expressions of the bourbon. And these are generally age or added ingredient and that sort of thing. But they also include uh, spin-off brands. So you've got the brand Jim Beam, and then you've got underneath that something else in a small, in a small writing. So you've got, that's category one. They are, I'm going to broadly call them expressions. And I'll just show the Lord's examples of that. The, uh, in that tab, you see the Jim Beam white label, 
the Jim Beam Double Oak, the Jim Beam Red Stag, the Jim Beam Rye is a very good example. And all of that is, is well established. The judge was quite right to understand that that was prevalent and uh, easy to um, accept as being a state of the market, particularly coming from Jim Beam. Now, my category two is um, different from that. And that is what was called at trial at times a play on words or a varied housemark brand, where you change the housemark. It's quite a simple question, quite a big difference. You don't use the, uh, the, mark, the, the house mark, or it's never or not seen effectively, and you make a play on it. Um, perhaps that's like Mr. Purvis's third category, brat, brat face and brat face, I don't know. But, but we, um, that is, you won't find an example clearly in the Jim Beam, but the example of that, if you just turn forward to the next tab, you've got Jack Daniels, again, category one is straight rye and sour mash at the bottom, say the bottom two. And then you've got Gentleman's Jack, Gentleman Jack, Jack Daniels, Gentleman Jack, in uh, page 15, top right-hand corner, £33.45. And that is, um, there's a bigger picture of that. If you please turn to tab 4, page 23, you'll have a page that looks a bit like that. Um, and that's obviously smaller than a bottle. A bottle will be maybe twice the size of that. I don't know. Um, and we say that, that's you've got your varied brand because the Jack, Gentleman Jack, um, and you've got uh, what do we have here? On the previous page, you'll see the only other example from Bourbon. These are the two examples that were found in the evidence that were found with no doubt with the efforts of the claimant's solicitor. Because it wasn't, as I say, um, in the expert report. Jack Daniels, Winter Jack. Um, that sorry, one I, is. I, I, I've seen it in the skeletons, but I can't. Oh, sorry, um, page 20. Sorry, yes, I, was, I hadn't given you a reference. Tab 4, page Thank 20. You. You'll see the Jack Daniels, Winter Jack, a big picture, and then 23, Jack Daniels, Gentleman Jack. Now, just to complete the picture, you've got, going back to the original tab 3 page 15, you've got the various expressions. There's a point on bottle shapes that has emerged in the skeletons. Uh, we say not much anything turns on that, um, because the judge's decision here was based on the names uh, and on the evidence. So I just wanted to show you a couple of other examples, because for completeness, these were said to be the, these were effectively the only, the only material. Wild Turkey, you'll find at tab five. Uh, now, this, I would say, brings in my third category and final, which is same distillery, different brand. Same distillery, different brand. So it's not really a brand extension at all, but uh, it might be. I don't, don't know how marketing people call these things. But, um, and the example of that is the Wild Turkey Russell Reserve. Rye, six years in the bottom right. The reason I say that is because, as, I, as far as I'm aware, that does not have wild turkey on the label, the bottle, or the neck, anything. So it's, it's produced at the same, by the same people, but it's a different. Another good example is, of course, um, uh, Sazerac's own Buffalo Trace whiskey. Same distillery, uh, completely different name. And so it, I think it has the eagle red. So that's important because you get a flavor, even looking at this, that the by far predominant practice is the expressions, where you use your house name and you have rye or sour mash or devil's cut or whatever it might be, and that's not changing your brand at all. The reason that's important is because this was a changed brand. This was a changed brand case. That was the judge's fundamental reasoning. It would be seen as a V. 
variation on the original brand, Eagle Rare. And that's um, something that actually, if one looks at the material, and we say one does need to look at the material, uh, really was only satisfied by um, Winter Jack and Gentleman Jack. Oh, sorry, I, while I'm here, I should show you the famous grouse. Uh, that was the other basis, because the judge mentioned it. Uh, I say, we say proceed with caution. This is a scotch, but um, certainly the judge could take it into account. The um, pictures in tab 7 are not very big, so it may be useful to look at my skeleton, because I've annexed them there. Tab three of the core bundle, last page. And actually, these will probably do for all of us, uh, for, for those bigger pictures that we're, one was looking at. Um, famous grouse, snow grouse, black grouse. Sorry, the black grouse, the snow grouse, the famous grouse. And um, you've got your grouse there standing in the same position, one covered with snow and one with a black label. I'm not sure it's black, grey and blue, something. And my lords, you say that uh, material that uh, was difficult for the judge to accommodate into the case First of all, he had no idea about the, whether this affected consumer perception. If you go onto the whiskey site, the, the fact that you might find um, Gentleman Jack or uh, Russell's or whatever, these, oh, we fully accept that one is, is bound to pare back the evidence. In trademark cases, some of them are, have too much evidence. But this is an issue that depending on the market, you ought to have evidence of, of some sort. Now, I, I say that... Apart from <clears throat> evidence that things have actually been marketed, yeah. what evidence do you need? Are you suggesting there should be a survey? So, so, uh, sales figures will do. Just sales figures and dates. The classic trademark evidence. No, we don't contend it needs to be a survey. If there was a big point on it, for example, if it was suggested at trial because it was properly in issue, that um, this wasn't the right practice. This is just a, something they've dredged up on the internet. One has to be very careful about um, making, uh, you know, there's no doubt that famous Krauss is famous. And Jack Daniels, we, we know, is not up, you know, filling the 90% category. But whether these particular products have any visibility was simply not in evidence. Now, what was in evidence and accepted was the expressions basis, my category one. That was clear. But that's not at all the same, or indeed not intricate or difficult to distinguish uh, from the case where you have a varied house brand. Now, I just wanted to show uh, towards the cross-examination. Uh, now, uh, if my lords take this supplemental bundle, tab eight. There's two pieces of cross-examination I'm going to take a look at. This one is very short. Uh, it's cross-examination. So it's pages 369, uh, sorry, page 46 of the bundle, 369 to 371. Uh, and he's being shown the uh, the Jim Beam results and the Red Stag, the Double Oak, if you look there, single barrel, six year old. And he's asked, this is a very common pattern in the whiskey and bourbon market to have many different expressions under the same branding. Do you agree? It is, yes. Uh, and we can see in the next tab, Jack Daniels, the same search on the Win Whiskey Exchange, there are 21 different versions, yes. And they do go up to some fairly silly prices towards the end. Uh, and they're small bottles, yes. Jack Daniels number seven is the standard product. They also have Gentleman Jack as a brand extension, have they not? Yes, they do. If you turn on tab 15, we have further plays on the Jack theme. 
You have Winter Jack, which is an apple whiskey punch. Yes. You also, so he's agreeing that that's what the documents show. You also have another picture of Gentleman Jack there. Yes, yes, I see that. Then Wild Turkey, a similar pattern in tabs 17 and 18. Uh, there are 13 Wild Turkey expressions and American, we have Wild Turkey, American Honey, tab 17, yes. It's perhaps not necessary to go through all of that, but let us pick up tab 31. He's taken to famous grouse. That's why I mentioned it to my laws. Yes, we have a number of expressions here. Many of them are famous grouse, but on page 114, we have the snow grouse, yes. Yes. Then we have famous grouse, smoky black. I think that has become uh, the black grouse, is what the expression <coughs> is. Uh, and he then says, the question, I think, is 371, if we could skip forward. So these are very common brand extension. This is a very common brand extension practice in the whiskey and bourbon market. Do you agree? Uh, sorry, what was the question? You were cut off. Um, the practice of extending a brand is very common in the whiskey and bourbon market. I think the practice of having many expressions under one brand name is very common, yes. And also plays on the brand name itself. Yes, absolutely, yes. So that seems to be the high point of the evidence, that he has been shown this material uh, and then um, has agreed that um, there are plays on the brand name. Now, he's then asked about gins uh, and, and other things. I think that's probably the end of what I needed to show. So the point is that that is then taken uh, as being uh, some kind of um, fulfillment of the evidential requirements of the judge's finding that this brand practice of varied brands as well as expression. So my categories one and two were both common. And we say that was not what the evidence showed. The um, judge ought to have uh, looked more critically at what uh, the very relatively few documents showed and uh, taken a view as to whether uh, it was right that Mr. Stevenson was um, correctly accepting even on the basis that he was being correctly asked, that uh, the um, varied brand basis, my category two, was uh, common. Because looking at the material, there was one, or sorry, two examples from bourbon, uh, and there was one example from scotch. And in both those cases, and this is the, the key point I wanted to show you, the main brand was on the bottom quite clearly. So in Gentleman Jack, you had Jack Daniels, Gentleman Jack, almost uh, uh, sitting on top of the word Gentleman Jack. Winter Jack, you had a big Jack Daniels and then Winter Jack. So it was both a play on and a non uh house name. And the grouse, you had clearly the uh, bird, the grouse, depicted in the classic logo of the famous grouse, but look dressed in a different way. So you realize they're different birds, Mr. Uh, they, they may be different birds, my lords. My lords one's a grouse, one's a ptarmigan, and one's a capercaillie. I'm very grateful, my lord. <laughs> <laughs> I was asking my junior yesterday whether they could fly, <laughs> <laughs> if it's any help about my, my knowledge of these things. Um, I'm grateful for that. The, uh, so, so the position we say is that the um, even the likes of Jack Daniels, even the likes of famous grouse, when they brand extend, to the extent that we even know that, this, that these are established on the market, could affect the consumer perception, um, even then, they don't, they don't make as big a leap as to completely sever the connection to the they don't rely only on the words. They don't rely only on the words. The um, famous grouse, or the winter jack, or the whatever it is, because they want to make it absolutely clear. And if one thinks about it, that does make sense, because they need to, they're leveraging off the power of the original mark. And they obviously want to make a play on the words, but they don't. Um, 
they don't uh, abandon the house mark. And that's important because a point that's made against me in my learned friend's skeleton is consumers don't know any of this. They just know there's brand extensions, uh, and they uh, attribute you know, a common origin to uh, these different products. Why do they do that? Well, you can, you can infer why they do that. It is the play on the name plus other indications of common origin, such as the house mark, and in the case of famous grouse, the, the, uh, if the similar birds, <laughs> not the same bird. Um, so we come, to, we, we come to that. We say, if you're going to look at the evidence, at least look at what it shows and um, take a view on that basis. Now, Mr. I said I'd take uh, Mr. Stevenson was asked some re-examination. Uh, he, you'll find that at three nine seven to three nine eight. Again, very short. Mr. Moody Stewart comes to him and asks him a final question. You were shown at three nine seven a number of different brands in the cross-examination bundle. You ask questions about it, and in particular in the context of bourbon. Just taking an example, I think you were shown Jack Daniels and Gentleman Jack. Do you recall those? Yes. Is there anything in terms of how brand extensions, as my learned friend calls them, work in whiskey? Have you experience of the market of how those generally work or are displayed? Generally speaking, the answer is, a collection of expressions might have different age statements to them, and therefore the price point will reflect it. What will then tend to happen, if you think you flick through some of the evidence there, you'll see the bottle shape tends to remain the same that the labelling might change, obviously the name of the brand will still be there. And what sometimes happens is if a brand is particularly expensive or rare expressions, they might then use a heavier weight bottle design or flip things around slightly to make it appear to be more luxury. Yes, that's generally the way it works. Now, you said the brand remains on the bottle. Can I show you the cross-examination bundle? He's shown the Gentleman Jack uh, uh, bottle. I think my learned friend mentioned Gentleman Jack a couple of times. Can you explain by reference to, to this what you meant by your previous answer? One second, he finds the tab. OK, using Jack Daniels as an example, you can see from page 49 onwards, the bottle shape is pretty consistent. The only ones that are different are Jack Daniels Gentleman Jack and Jack Daniels Single Barrel, both of which are more premium line extensions of the basic Jack Daniels old number seven product. What is there to say about it? They're all still Jack Daniels products. They still have the Jack Daniels logo on them, albeit the Gentleman Jack, that particular title, takes precedent over the Jack Daniels logo, which can still be seen above it. Now, if one maps that onto paragraph 66 of the judgment, The judge is finding that a majority of purchasers are likely to have brand loyalty, which is his um, average consumer finding. Um, and they may, I can see there's little likelihood that a significant proportion would be confused into thinking it's the same. So that's the, the, the direct confusion. Um, and he then finds strength in the image of the American Eagle. He gives the new eagle, eagle special variation. He then goes to um, calling the distinctive, uh, the, 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 the calling to mind basis, um, and straight into 69, which is the reliance on, on this material. Um, he notes that they weren't asked to deal with it, but. Um, Mr. Stevenson, with whom Mr. Hainsworth and Mr. Bradbury agreed, said it was a very common pattern in the whiskey and bourbon market to have many different expressions under the same branding, including plays on the name. The examples of Jack Daniels, producing Gentleman Jack and Winter Jack, and the famous grouse, producing the snow grouse and black grouse, were put to Mr. 
Stevenson, who agreed they were examples of this pattern. And, and then he refers to the re-examination. In re-examination, Mr. Stevenson said that a collection of expressions might have different age statements, and the bottle shape generally stayed the same, though perhaps with different labeling. And obviously, the name of the brand will still be there. American Eagle bottles do not, of course, use the name Eagle Rare anywhere on the bottle. Um, so the judges, this is critical, we say, to the finding on indirect confusion. We can see that from the ensuing paragraphs. He says, uh, the proper basis for indirect confusion must be that a substantial proportion of the relevant public would be aware of distilleries and other distilleries in a group of economically linked undertakings produce different expressions or variants of the same brand or different products, or brands that are connected with each other. Uh, there must be, and so the judge actually set himself the task, there must be sufficient evidence to establish, as a matter of logic and deduction, a likelihood that confusion about such a connection will exist. Confusion cannot be established by speculation or the mere possibility that any one or more products are from the same stable or connected undertaking. I remind myself that indirect confusion is not a consolation prize. And 71 is, we say, the most curious finding, because uh, the first sentence, uh, I find it both common and well known <coughs> in the spirits market in the UK, including the respective bourbon sub-markets, for producers not only to have different expressions of brands, so the, my category one, but also to release different products with different names that may or may not allude directly or indirectly to another brand. So this is a, a categories two and three, I suppose, but category two being the one of interest. And he specifically refers to Ms. Mr. Stevenson evidence. And Mr. Stevenson very readily accepted that was so. He did refer to the presence of the senior brand name on the bottle somewhere. But he was answering a question about how different expressions of the same brand were presented, and doing so by reference to actual examples in the documentary evidence. I didn't take his comment to, be, to the effect that all sub-brands or connected brands include on the label a reference to the main brand. Uh, in any event, the average consumer would not have that expectation or scrutinize the label to ascertain whether any link was found. Now. There are a number of points in that paragraph. Uh, we say, while it's perfectly permissible to call, for example, a trade witness to deal with this material, the key, the key issue is always going to be, what does the material show? Um, and uh, this evidence was too flimsy to support the judges finding of it being both common and well known in the spirits market in the UK uh, and EU. Um, there are, we say, two examples given and uh, that actually come from bourbon and one uh, and then uh, one being spun out the famous grouse, which is of, of, of some relevance perhaps. But, and by the way, Mr. Stevenson uh, wasn't asked detail any questions about famous grouse, so the, the reliance just seems to have been on the material. Um, and Mr. Stevenson's uh, additional point about these, uh, these, these products containing the brand on them, certainly Winter Jack and uh, uh, Gentleman Jack, was, we say, mischaracterized. It wasn't confined to expressions. It was, he was talking there about Gentleman Jack. And he was saying, the consumer will see that. So, and my Lord, that's why I showed you the, the, the near bottle shaped one, the larger photograph. It's quite clear. It's embossed on the bottle and it's sitting there on top of the Gentleman Jack words. So, we say that um, that's important because either you're not going to find there is such a practice, or if you are going to rely on the material. Uh, one, it's going to make more demands of the party relying on it to establish uh, the degree to which it has been used and has affected consumer perception. Lord, another way, it just occurred to me that, the, that this is quite analogous to another, ex another issue that arises commonly in trademarks, is when you deal with the defendant wants to rely on a whole lot of other marks that are similar to what he's doing. 
it says, look at, the, look at all these similar vodkas, for example, that use, <laughs> that aren't vodka, but use vodka type style imagery or sky formative marks or whatever it might be. Um, that has to be proved. You can't just simply say it's out there. It has to be proved the extent to which it's got any significance. And this is what was missing. Um, but if it was there, then it should have been um, acknowledged as requiring, invariably, a connection to the main brand that went beyond the play on words. Mr. Uh, Marlitz, you, make, you, you make a point that the judge clearly refers to this as, as different expressions. And you've given us three categories, and you've put expression as one category out yes. of three. But isn't it fair to say that the re-examination only was on the footing that there was one category, which was called ex brand extensions? Yes. So, so I don't understand why it's um, a it's legitimate criticism of the way the judge analysed that specific bit of evidence. Yes. Because it was only being... Well, I know you've, put, you've invented three categories, but yeah. it wasn't the way it was being put to the court. So um, if I could just... If you look at 71 the judgment, the judge is dealing with um, the point about the brand being on the bottle. Um, and it's the judge that uses the words different expressions. Mm -hmm. Now, expressions is a term of art. That's not mine. That's The, the experts use that. And I think sure. that's the uh, wry sound. You see that expression. In the, in so, so that's right. So then um, if we go to the cross-examination, what we see of Mr. Stevenson. He does uh, specifically talk about the, um, not just the expressions, but the varied, varied brand, which the judge is distinguishing here. So he goes on, it was the passage we looked to at the end, um, using Jack Daniel. So the question was, in re-examination, um, was yes, that's right. That, that was quite right. He talks about in terms of how brand extensions, as my learned friend calls them, work. That's a global term. And then we get into expressions at the bottom of the page, and then we specifically look at gentleman Jack. So it, it actually doesn't matter what we're going to call them for this purpose. Because the judge has confined them, we say in that passage of the judgment, or confined or neutralized, it appears, the effect of Mr. Stevenson's evidence by saying that he's talking about different expressions. I didn't take his comment to be to the effect that all sub brands or connected brands include. But what he was talking about was the only example I would put to him, or one of the main ones, Gentleman Jack. Um, and we know it's on Winter Jack. So, uh, just as a general point, I don't know how significant this is, but you know, this, is, this was the claimant's cross-examination bundle. One can uh, imagine that they got the best examples they could, probably the only examples they could, that they could uh, at that point. So that really is the first um, point on, on indirect confusion. The second one, I think I can take more quickly. Uh, if we can just look straight at the cross-examination for that one, we can stay in the same tab. Um, page 40 of that tab, a bit earlier. And this is Mr. Moody Stewart cross-examining the claimant's expert on a different issue. Uh, and in the time-honored uh, tradition, he's seeking to establish that consumers can distinguish between brands in this sector. Uh, and he is putting to Mr. Allenson, if you look at the top of the page, 232, in general, you would agree that the consumer pays attention to what they're doing in the, or ordering in the bourbon market. In general, I'd agree with you, yes. In the whiskey and bourbon market, consumers are well used to differentiating between brands with similar names, are they not? Uh, if you remember them, yes, says Mr. Allenson. And then... Just because there's a similar name, they do not assume their sister products from the same maker, do they? I'm not sure I can actually answer that for the entire market. I could only answer that on a personal level. Uh, OK, let us have a look on a personal level. 
And then what happens is we can move forward a little bit. The um, Mr. Moody Stewart's dealing with issues relating to uh, whiskey, Scotch whiskies, and a lot are called Glen something. A lot are called. A lot are quite similar because of the um, names. If you look at uh, line 18 of page 233, um, if you scroll through these, please, Mr. Allenson. I think they were looking at the material on my iPads. You go from Arbefeldy to Arbalor. Those are close names, but consumers distinguish between them. They're place names in Scotland, and you may get confused between Aberfeldy and Arbalor if you cannot remember which Aber you're talking about. Um, but people would not think they were from the same distillery, would they? In this instance, no. So th this is a, a point that, should we say, is, isn't really getting anywhere. Um, and on the whiskies, uh, and then Mr. Council turns to the um, issue of bourbons. So there's Glens at the bottom of the Glens and Spays at the bottom of uh, 235. And then he comes to bourbons on 236, line 9, moving on to bourbons. And what he does is he puts a series of pairs of bourbons. And the Lord's doesn't, don't have those in the bundles, but I don't think the Lord need, need them. Um, the proposition which was being put here was, uh, look at this bourbon, look at that bourbon. Um, people can tell the difference. And Mr. Allenson disagreed. Mr. Allenson said, uh, say, for example, that just to give you the two examples that the judge dealt with here, um, question at line 16. Then you have Yellow Rose Premium American Whiskey. Yes, yes. Uh, and then if you look at line 20, yes, I've not heard of Yellow Rose other than seeing it now. Um, and then answer at the bottom of that page. I can only answer the fact that I don't know Yellow Rose. And then the question, uh, his final, his, his, his answer, hold on, he has a little bit of trouble loading. And then um, 237, line 5. Other than reading the label with the knowledge I have, I can tell it's from a separate distillery. If you were to tell me Yellow Rose and Four Roses, I may think they're from the same distillery, from my knowledge and what I can see on the label. Um, and then he is asked about Heaven Hill and Heaven's Door, line 9. Again, these are names that are similar, and a consumer of bourbon would look at these and would not assume they were from the same product or had come from the same source because of the similarities in the name. The answer is, again, you're looking at a huge brand versus something tiny. Then there is the potential to get confused, I would say, because you've got heaven and heaven, heavens. There is potential with those two because they are related to brand names. As we talked about Scotch, they're not brand names. They're place names. So he's making a distinction, actually, between... Uh, uh, average consumers understanding in scotches and uh, average consumers understanding in uh, bourbons. But um, that is uh, it. He says uh, uh, there's a potential to be confused, I would say, because you have heaven and heavens. There is a potential with those two because they're related to brand names. I do not know how many heavens there are in America, but I only know of one Heaven Hill distillery. I think that's it for the purposes of the cross-examination. Um, now, what should have happened there, just looking at that cross-examination, is Mr. Moody Stewart was trying to establish the proposition. Consumers can are used to a very crowded market. They can tell the difference between brand names, and uh, they don't get confused. The expert disagreed, and that point should have gone nowhere. That should be the end of it. But what happened? Meaning what exactly? Uh, meaning that um, Mr. Moody Stewart failed to establish the proposition, and indeed he did fail. He established the proposition that there was such a high level of perspicacity on the part of consumers that they could tell the difference between names which apparently have some similarity. I mean, I, I'm not trying to say the, the submission is a particularly strong one. It, it is made quite frequently in trademark cases, I should say. but. Um, it is, it is what it is. It's not what the judge used this evidence for. What the judge then used Mr. Stevenson, sorry, Mr. Allenson's answers for was in effect uh, as a proxy for the average consumer. And 
that we say was wrong as a matter of principle, wrong as a, as a matter of fact, as logic based upon the answers given. Um, Sorry, I, I don't begin to understand that submission because you've accepted, I think, that the judge was entitled, taking this evidence into account, to make the finding that he did make with regard to the characteristics of the average consumer. So if you accept that, in what way was it illegitimate to treat the evidence as, as you put it, a proxy for the average consumer? Because that's precisely the point which you accept the judge was entitled to find. Um, well, I don't accept that Mr. Allenson could himself stand proxy for the average consumer. And I don't actually accept that the, this whole line of questioning was actually going to have a bearing on the average consumer. Because in fact, it might be that you'd be, I mean, I'd be skeptical personally about whether that is ever established. So I don't, my Lord, just to be clear on that, I do not accept, I know this is my cross-examination on my side, but I don't accept that that makes it uh, something I rely upon on appeal. So I do not accept that this is material has a bearing on the uh, findings of the average consumer. It was an attempt to for, for it to have a bearing that wasn't accepted. In other words, um, it was an attempt to establish that consumers are highly knowledgeable and highly perspicacious that failed. And that's all. But if it was an attempt to establish relevant evidence yeah. one way, the fact the witness gave the answer the council didn't want yes. doesn't mean it's not, a, not relevant evidence anymore. It means the evidence is against. So far as it goes, that is right. But it, but it must work both ways round. Yes, right? yes, yes. I, I accept that. But That's why I don't understand the point. Yes, OK. So I, I, think, I, think, I think I've understood my, um, uh, my position was not well explained. Obviously, it's in the mix, but it does not define what the average consumer will do, or will basically you're asking whether, on a hypothetical, the average consumer would be confused between two different brands from the ones at issue in this case. I mean, you wouldn't be able to ask the expert, or you shouldn't be able to ask the expert, about the brands here. What is it you're trying to establish when you say people would confuse them or wouldn't confuse it's just not material. So, well, yes, it could be, I'm not excluding it. I certainly I know that there was no application to exclude it, and I can't object to it. But we say it was of zero weight, really absolutely zero weight, for all manner of reasons. First of all, um, Mr. Uh, Allenson hadn't even heard of yellow roses. So it was a sort of a survey. It was artificial stimulus to him being administered in the box. Um, secondly, these marks, uh, I mean, what does people's propensity to confuse different marks tell you about the marks in issue in your case? Nothing. There's no useful data there. Um, thirdly, if you look at these particular marks, they didn't follow the pattern, if you could say, of infringement in this case. This was same position, sort of common element in the same position, either the first word or the second word. That's not our case. The judge placed importance on the fact that American came first and was seen as a composite whole. So it just was not our case at all. Um, and there is a point about whether an expert's personal reaction, I showed you the bit of cross-examination where he said, OK, now I'm going to get into my personal reaction. Um, there's a point at which that's just simply um, of no value to the court at all. I mean, if anything, it, it um, positively distracts, because Mr. Mr. Allenson can't step out of the shoes of his knowledge, of his, of his persona as a, as a highly knowledgeable bourbon expert. So really, his personal reaction something he hasn't seen before. I mean, put it this way, if he were a survey respondent, he wouldn't, <laughs> he wouldn't be, make it into the mix, I would have thought. So, um, uh, my lords, I'm sure, are, are 
abundantly familiar with the um, requirements for both admissible expert evidence or weight, expert evidence of weight, and of course survey evidence, and I wasn't going to go through that. But we say, um, the, uh, if you look at the way that the judge relied upon this quite heavily, 71, um, this is cause for concern, because this was the other basis. We had the uh, gentleman jack and winter jack, and then we had the um, we had this material. I find it common and well known, the, the bit we looked at. Um, and then uh, he goes on. Seventy-three. He goes. I consider there's a likelihood of a significant proportion of the bourbon markets in the EU being confused. It's common for connected brands to have similar names, and he cross refers to the um, brand extension uh, examples. And then the average consumer would be aware of the fact that brands have different expressions of connected products. It's natural to consider, as Mr. Allenson did, when presented for the first time with Yellow Rose and Heaven's Door that there was a connection with the Four Roses and Heaven Hills brand. So the judge is proceeding on the basis that this is a first-time stimulus to an expert of different brands. Uh, and I understand there's also a question about whether they are even available in the UK, but I don't know if that's actually resolved. Um, so this was important to the judge. One might say that a judge is entitled to take a view just to ignore that, look at the marks and reach a view, but um, the judge's views on direct confusion along those lines were totally favorable to us. And what's, um, we say, highly surprising, remarkable, is the way that the judge looked at the expert evidence here um, and grappled with a concept in direct confusion which is not free from difficulty. I don't think in the end there's much between my learned friend and me on the law on this, because I think we're both saying the same thing. It's a species of confusion. It comes up in an appropriate case. Judges are entitled to look at it. The judge here was entitled to look at it. But it's not completely free from difficulty, and there aren't many cases on this kind of uh, indirect confusion. Um, the Cristalino, uh, Champagne Louis Roda is another example. but. Um, there's many other kinds of connections that are made between brands. Uh, but this was a particular, and we say evidence-specific one. But the material wasn't there, and the two struts for the judge's reasoning, we say, uh, fall away. The, uh, um, the indirect confusion material and the four roses. I said that there was one a third basis, which I wanted to show you. Actually, before I turn to that, I just would it be worth if I just showed you the Eshaw case very briefly? Bundle one of your bundle of authorities, tab one, page 23. Just because it's the first big cases where this really got started about experts giving evidence on confusion. Um, what does Mr. How does it say? He says consumers will be confused. Um, he's actually, he's either saying he's going to be confused, or he's saying consumers are going to be confused. And if you look at, um, I've lost my page reference there. You've got a page reference there. Uh, I think I'll do it. Uh, 23, yeah, great, thanks. The, um, Pick it up at 23, um, paragraph 72. Uh, this was uh, the evidence of a branding expert, Mr. Blackett. And so he wasn't a, a bourbon whiskey trade expert being instructed to assist the court on uh, um, the trade, the, 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 the market, um, as here. But he was a, a branding expert. Uh, and he made various uh, observations uh, in his report. First of them, in my capacity as an expert on branding, I think the direct line telephone device is both striking and original. Uh, it's now very well known as achieved iconic status. Well, well, you do not need an expert to tell you any of that. Uh, the facts speak for themselves, and if that had not been searched so, 
that an assertion to the contrary would have been wrong. That's a bit like what's going <coughs> on here on the um, on the brand on the sub branding. Um, you've got to show it's not enough to say yes, it's commonplace or it's there. It's not a binary question. It's what do you mean? How long? How 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 big is it? How how prevalent is it? And then um, he goes on, Mr. Blackett, to say, in my opinion, below seventy three, that people will confuse the eShore mouse on wheels. Uh, and then um, I think it's just Jay. Justice Jacob, you can tell by the style. His reasons for the assertion are simply argument. I repeat the whole of it as set out in his first report, so it's essentially assertive nature can be seen, uh, and then what should be avoided in future cases, and then uh, argument. 75, it's of course permissible for an expert to opine on the ultimate question if it's one of fact, not law, as I said in my judgment, uh, Technique France. Um, and uh, Morris Kale, J agrees. And there's been there's been some authorities since then. Of course, my law, my law, law justice's judgment in uh, the Glaxo uh, pre-trial review, uh, and there's also been I know my, my law, law justice Bursa's uh, judgment in the Rihanna case uh, on the issue of what's expert evidence, what's not, and so on. Uh, when it came to this material, this this was a personal reflection uh, by the by Mr. Uh, Alexander was really was. Um, worthless as evidence and yet was relied upon. So the final basis on this, uh, and then I can just talk briefly about context and close that. Um, final basis can be seen uh, in so there's two paragraphs, I'll show you back to the judgment. So paragraph 24 of the judgment is where it is set up factually um, about this is talking about the four year old American Eagle So you've got Eagle Rare 17-year-old, which is really very lofty in terms of its reputation and very hard to get hold of. Then you've got American Eagle 8-year-old, which will be a direct competitor with ten, Eagle Rare 10-year-old, um, albeit American Eagle 12-year-old at a slightly higher, considerably more expensive level. So those are sort of the, the ones middle and top. And then you've got the four-year-old version of American Eagle. It's a little lower in price and will compete with both the mass market brands like Jack Daniels and Jim Beam, um, as well as middle market ones like Eagle Rare. The volume of sales through multiples to which the defendants aspire will be far in excess of sales of exposure. As a result, in time, more consumers of bourbon whiskey will become aware of American Eagle than are aware of Eagle Rare because, effectively, of the four-year-old. Um, then we look, sorry, at uh, 71 of the judgment. This is the last um, reasoning on the indirect basis. I find it's both common and well known uh, in the spirits market, including the sub markets, for them to have different expressions to release different products with different names. Mr. Stevenson, uh, sorry, it's uh, sorry, 75. Yes, it starts off with the same point. Confusion is more likely when a trademark is distinctive. The test is whether that association between a mark creates a risk that the public might believe that respective goods and services come from the same economically linked undertaking. I consider that there is such a risk because the product is identical and the names have marked similarity indicative of a possible connection and because of the existence of connected brands. In particular, once American Eagle four-year-old is established and becomes more widely known than Eagle Rare, having been positioned by the defendants to compete with Jack Daniels and the like in the mass market, it will be natural for a consumer to assume that Eagle Rare is a special version of American Eagle. So it's effectively, this is now indirect and in the wrong, wrong direction. I'm not saying that's not open to him, but it hasn't happened. And it can't be assumed to happen, although there's, an ev there's evidence that that's what we were uh, focusing on. Um, the danger of that sort of analysis is 
one of course can take account of reasonable probabilities and so on. But the, because of the point that I'm now going to talk about when it comes to context, a sub-brand connection would depend upon all manner of issues like that. Um, there is a, a slight issue on wrong way around confusion, which I hope I can just very briefly address you on. Um, without turning to it, in the Comic Enterprises case, the uh, Court of Appeal, or Justice Kitchen, held that it is open to uh, courts, to uh, judges, to find relevant that there have been instances of wrong way around confusion, uh, and that that you know, confusion is not required to be in any direction, any particular direction, and may be simply happenstance as to which uh, of the sides is encountered first. And, and that makes sense in circumstances where you have actual instances of confusion. Because someone has encountered one of the sides first and believed it to be the other. Um, Lord or Justice Arnold may remember the, the decision of BDO being much the same uh, sort of thing. Um, it can be relevant when there are actual instances of people thinking that the claimant is the defendant rather than the other way around. Um, but that's not what we're dealing with here. We'd only just entered the market, and we weren't anywhere near. And there was no instances of any kind of fusion of any kind. And so it was entirely hypothetical uh, that there might be in the future a situation which could be supportable on a wrong way around. Uh, I'm basis. at a loss to understand what submission you're making. Because as I understand it, you accept the judge was not really entitled but correct to have regard to what might happen in the future. Yes. That's obviously correct because it's of the very nature of the test of likelihood of confusion. It's yes. Forward looking. It's prospective, yes. So he's not in error in having regard to what might happen in the future. Correct. Yes. You also accept, as I understand it, that so called wrong way round confusion is confusion of which a trademark proprietor can legitimately complain. Yes. So where then is the error? <laughs> My lord, I accept that wrong way around confusion is something of which a trademark proprietor can legitimately complain as rele of as relevant evidence of confusion, actual confusion. What I don't accept is that the uh, court faced with a claimant and a defendant and a registered trademark on the part of the claimant to use the reputation of the defendant in the future to assume there will be actual confusion. And that's the point, my lord, because we say that the cases Comic Enterprises and BDO only support the fact that wrong way around confusion is relevant where there are actual examples of the of confusion happening. You can't do it notionally in the wrong way around, we say. <coughs> because you, you simply, otherwise you are in effect imagining a world where the defendant has a registered trademark and you're trying to understand how much reputation it has in some future date. What, and does it get stripped of its context at this point and the claimant gets a context? I mean, that's the problem. That's why one has to be quite careful with wrong way around confusion, we say. It's merely a, um, it is a, it is relevant as, uh, perhaps it might be worth looking at um, the, the comic enterprise case after all. So I sort of skipped over that in uh, anticipation of the point being sure. But, uh, That is tab 10 of bundle, bundle 2 of the authorities. Page number, got it, 440.
461 is the relevant passage. But I wonder if I might just look at 440 for a moment. Dispute between uh, the proprietors of the Glee Club, uh, comedy club, who had a res registration for the Glee Club, uh, and they sued Fox, uh, 20th Century Fox, in relation to uh, a television series called Glee. Uh, and the examples of confusion in the wrong way round were all evidence driven. So uh, the, uh, I just wonder if that can be quickly. Yes, here it is. If you look at um, page 443, um, the head note 11. That's on passing off, actually, Hulk. So that's quite different. Um, page 9, so page 442, previous page. Um, Fox did challenge the finding that the registered trademarks had a sufficient reputation to qualify for the extended form of protection, but argued that infringement could only be the right way around where it's founded on reputation, um, and therefore erred in, in that respect. Um, and uh, H7. Going backwards, apologise. Um, that's on the garden variety um, 10 2 infringement. Fox contended that the deputy judge's conclusion had been entirely driven by evidence of wrong way round confusion and that he'd erred in such evidence was both legally and factually irrelevant. Um, uh, he had ignored the context. And then Fox was arguing that the reaction of such consumers was caused by um, uh, CEL's use of different signage. Um, and then the registered mark and sign could be easily distinguished. So this is the, the head note. And what's the main finding page? Sorry. 461. Not the most illuminating head note. But anyway. Um, it's important to have the statutory test in mind. The test is a likelihood of confusion on the part of the public, as the Lord Justice Kitchen. Um, as we've seen, the question must be considered from the perspective of the average consumer. Mr. Purvis rightly accepts that in arriving at a conclusion as to whether the consumer would be confused, the court may in some circumstances be assisted by spontaneous evidence from members of the public. Mr. Purvis also accepts that this may extend to reliance upon second-hand evidence of the reaction of members uh, but the court must be careful to consider whether these people were confused at all. Um, in my judgment, I'll just take it, just go straight to 45. The deputy judge summarised the evidence of all the witnesses. Within that discussion, he did address each of the witnesses individually, but his consideration of the relevance of this evidence. So, how does this help us? Because this is all about the assessment of evidence. Correct in the particular circumstances of yes. the case and the fact that it is. the deputy judge in his judgment had dealt with it rather cursorily. I mean, the legal question is it actually addressed later in the judgment, in particular at 79 and 80, yes. where the court concludes, for the reasons given by Lord Justice Kitchen in those paragraphs, that as a matter of law, wrong way round confusion is something that can be relied upon. Yes. As you accept. Yes. But uh, the only point I draw from this, my lord, is this is talking about the instance of wrong way round confusion and whether that can be relevant. So it's dealing with actual happenings of, actual occurrences of. And one can see that. That's why I was taking you to the earlier the earlier bits, which weren't the clearest I accept. But... Um, the um, point if that you I'm look at 79, the generality of the analysis yeah. is not confined to the past, as one would expect. I find myself, first thing that changes a trade draft. Uh, the comparison is between the sign and the mark. The court must identify the sign which the defendant has actually used and the context in which he's used it. And this must be compared to a notional fair use of the mark. The mark may or may not have been used. May have been used in relation to some, but not all the goods. Yes, the last sentence. The question in every case remains the same, yes. never, namely whether, having regard to a notional fair use of the mark in relation yep. to all of the goods or services for which is registered in the actual use of the sign, there is a risk yep. that the average consumer might think that the goods or services come from the same undertaking or economically linked 
undertakings, and that is all. Yep. That my order. So it's Especially always looking. looking. I accept that. Accept that. But it has to be understood against the matrix of fact, the judgment, which is people are exposed to the claimant's sign and think of the defendant's. Right. So the question is, at what point is that being uh, caused by the uh, similarities between the signs, between the defendant's sign and the claimant's mark? Um, and the next point that arises is, you have got material of that happening. So it's, it's not that it's um, not a generality. It is a generality. Uh, uh, but this instance, this case, and the BDO case, are purely cases where there was quite a lot of wrong way round actual confusion, and the court was considering the materiality of it. Actually, my lord may recall, he did not consider it particularly important. He said it was no more than the helpful on the similarity of signs, which it may be. But here, um, Lord Justice Kitchen is saying, as a matter of principle, it can be, it, 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 uh, there's nothing wrong with considering it as relevant in the generality to a likelihood of confusion because it's really and he risk explains risk. further why in paragraph 80 because he says whether you call it right way round or wrong way round can be a consequence of nothing more exactly. than the order in which the consumer yes. has to come across them exactly. and in both cases uh, it can be equally damaging to the yeah. distinctive of the functions of the mark yes absolutely I mean oh Lord, the only point I'm making is, is that where you've got it happening you've got something to go on because you can assess, well, how has this happened? They've seen the defendant's sign in context, and they've been exposed to the claimant's mark in context or not, doesn't, doesn't necessarily arise. So I'm satisfied that that is just a happenstance as to when, who is first, and it's material on the question of likelihood of confusion. But any situation where there's a risk that you're depriving the defendant of his context must not be right as a matter of principle. And any situation where you are assuming in the defendant's fa in the claimant's favour that the defendant has swamped the market, effectively this is a swamping analysis. I accept that the, um, uh, of course, that the judge can look prospectively. And, but just because we're going to be um, marketing the four-year-old and there will be more, why should that be material to a finding of effectively swamping? I mean, we are more known than uh, we might be unsuccessful. I'm still struggling to understand what your submission is. Now, if what you're submitting is that the judge shouldn't speculate, that, that I can understand. That's a perfectly clear submission. Um, and as is well known, one always has to be careful about drawing the distinction between proper inference and illegitimate speculation. Yes. So that's a submission I can understand. But is there some other point that you're trying to make? Um, my Lord has my submission. That okay. is exactly my submission. The judge is speculating. And the danger of that speculation is he's, he's assuming a, 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 a set of circumstances that are unfavorable when that may not be the case. Uh, obviously, if he speculated in my favor, I'd be delighted. <laughs> but no, he shouldn't speculate. And, uh, and, and that, was a, that was the only other basis on which he has um, uh, found any uh, indirect confusion. <coughs> Can I just make sure I've understood what you're saying? The, I understand the point that we've, we've arrived at, that your submission is that the judge shouldn't speculate, putting it, putting it briefly. I get that. But I wasn't clear, but I think you're not, and that's why I'm asking you. You're not submitting that if the judge was entitled to reach the conclusion he reached in that sentence in 75, that that conclusion is somehow not relevant or, or, or well, not relevant. You're not saying that. Let me just revisit the conclusion to 75. I'll close my bundle. Uh, I mean, the conclusion is that there's a risk of indirect, of, um, Call it wrong way round confusion. Yeah, that's um, if established, uh, and if not a subject of speculation, that would be legitimate in the 
can't. So okay. That's it what is thought. possible to have wrong way round in direct confusion. <laughs> yeah. No more than that. Um, so, uh, so context was the next point I was going to come to very quickly. I think we've got to deal with that before lunch. Um, the point we make on context is essentially uh, it's a short one. Uh, we don't, uh, although we, although there's obviously some uncertainty about how far it goes, um, we say that's principally just because of the flexibility of the test by uh, or Justice Kitchen in Specsavers. Uh, all the circumstances operating on the mind, uh, which might be said to be broad or narrow as the case demands, but it's flexible. Uh, and but the second thing we would say is that um, in a case of brand extension, where the judge is, he's found no direct confusion, and he's now looking at brand extension, we say there would be it would be right having directly uh, correctly directed himself to the test to consider a context which shows that branding practice or the sub branding or brand variation practice so the starting point is he should be looking at a context that either affirms or contradicts the existence of a branding practice but the judge only proceeded on the basis of the names. Um, really, it comes to this. Uh, we say that having looked at the bottle and noted that it doesn't contain Eagle Rare on it, which was a fairly obvious thing to, to note, um, the judge ought to have come to the view that the context, insofar as it was relevant, um, militated against any finding of indirect confusion. And that's the link between the two uh, parts of the case for us. <coughs> we say uh, it did not have any of the trappings of uh, indirect confusion. I mentioned the eagle a moment ago. It didn't, you know, that, that eagle, our eagle is different, but it doesn't really matter because uh, the judge didn't take it into account. Of more importance, we did see the Gentleman Jack and Winter Jack a strong reference to the original house mark. And if that's the if that's the formula, then it's of significance that that was that there was nothing like that on the. Uh, of course, it wasn't going to have Eagle Rare on it, but uh, there was nothing like that. Now it's said against me um, that I'm relying on the absence of context, or the absence uh, uh, is, not, is not legitimate. Uh, not so, we say. Um, context is all the circumstances that operate on the mind of the consumer. And um, a clean, uncluttered layout. I think it was uh, Apple and Samson. A cool, <laughs> minimalist layout that doesn't have uh, any What's the register Echo. design case? It, it, it was, it was. I, <laughs> it was probably a, a, an unnecessary record. But the, but the point is that it doesn't have the kind of um, uh, markings, if you will, or layout of, or context of, or any indication, any telltale sign of a sub-brand. And that was not, uh, and that was relevant. I say no more than that, it was it should have been taken into account. Now, I don't know if Rand endorses the judge's approach, which was to effectively strip my mark of any uh, stylization of my bird device, uh, which we say is configured as the as sort of in the great seal, presidential seal way, whereas the claimant's one, I know it's not relevant, but uh, only to passing off. Just by contrast, is a, is a is a naturalistic depiction. So it is quite, and the judge picked up on that with the words, as Lord Justice Arnold corrected me, but not the uh, not the bird. 
all of that was um, relevant for him to understand whether there was any suggestion on the bottle that it could be a sub-brand. We say it's a, it's a short point. Uh, the question, I think, the controversy between us is, is it possible or indeed appropriate to uh, rely on the absence of something as a question of context? We say yes. If people expect something to be there and it's not there, it's relevant. It's a circumstance operating on the mind of the consumer. Uh, and that's really, um, I think, the beginning and end of our uh, context uh, submissions. Let me just... Those are my submissions on the uh, two appeals. Thank you. Mr. Alexander. I would, if I can address your lordships in response to uh, that and then pick up a couple of points on the respondent's notice. Um, our, our overall submission, as your lordships will have gathered, is that this is a straightforward case where the judge uh, reached an entirely unsurprising conclusion uh, on the basis of a detailed and careful evaluation of the evidence. Uh, and an entirely correct uh, set of uh, statements of the law. The, the, the summary uh, that, uh, uh, of the case is this. Um, this is the mark where there are uh, two, well, a case where there, there are two marks which contain a plainly distinctive common element, where the judge held that although uh, members of the public, the average consumer, wouldn't think that the products were the same product, side by side, and they would think that they came from the same trade origin, since the whole purpose of trademark law is to protect against confusion as to trade origin. The uh, conclusion that the judge uh, reached in uh, our submission is an entirely sensible and rational one. What I propose to do is uh, address you, uh, as my learned friend did, first of all in relation to indirect confusion, uh, and then the, the very briefly in the light of the submissions just now on context, uh, and uh, do so in the following way. First, to show you a little bit of the law relating to indirect confusion, as far as you haven't looked at it already, and then really take your lordship through, your lordship and my, my, my lady's uh, uh, ships through the uh, judgment, showing why uh, the uh, judge was entirely justified in reaching the conclusion that he reached. Uh, and um, in so doing, I can pick up the points that are made on the evidence. So can I turn to uh, law, first of all, on uh, so-called indirect con uh, confusion, and pick that up uh, in the uh, judge's judgment at the paragraph that we were looking at, uh, where he set out the law in paragraph 28. He there set out the familiar summary in uh, Comic Enterprises, uh, and uh, the last paragraph of that, subparagraph of that, is K. Uh, it, it really summarizes the position. The association between the mark creates a risk that the public might believe the respective goods or services come from the same or economically linked undertakings. There is a likelihood of confusion. Uh, that is a proposition that is so well established from the uh, cases going back through Savile, Cannon, uh, uh, it, it's not uh, necessary to go through, through, through all of those. The judge then uh, elaborates on that in paragraph 31 of um, uh, the judgment, where he explains uh, that uh, what paragraph 31, uh, paragraph K is getting at is that uh, there can be different ways in which confusion uh, in the public mind can take place. There may be direct confusion, where there is a risk that the consumer will think that one brand is, in fact, another brand, uh, whether through uh, imperfect recollection or otherwise. But there may be other cases where uh, there is something that has come to be described as indirect confusion, where there's a risk that the consumer will think that one product uh, is uh, linked to it through the trademark by being uh, from the, tra the same uh, uh, trade origin. Uh, and uh, those are both instances of uh, the general concept of customer confusion against which the law of registered trademarks uh, is, uh, is there to protect. 
But when one comes to look at the authorities relating to that and the origin of the discussion on indirect confusion, we can pick that up in the uh, L.A. Sugar case, which is in... Authorities Bundle 3 and 15. And uh, again, I don't want to dwell on this because your lordships uh, are, are very familiar with this uh, already. Uh, my lady may not be quite so familiar with their case, so uh, I'll uh, just take this slightly more. Um, uh, more completely. Paragraph 16 uh, sets out the analysis in, in similar terms uh, to uh, that uh, that I've just uh, shown at the court, uh, where essentially what is said is that one needs to think a little bit about what the process of reasoning is that an average consumer would go through in reaching a conclusion that there was uh, confusion. Uh, and uh, in paragraph 17, um, Mr. Purvis uh, sets out a number of typical instances uh, where one can expect the average con uh, consumer to reach the uh, conclusion in question and the categories uh, which, uh, uh, in which that may occur. Those are not exclusive categories, but they are um, examples of, of uh, that, that situation. First of all, where the common element is so strikingly distinctive that the average consumer would assume that no one else but the brand owner would be using the trademark at all. And he uses as an example 26 Red Tesco, where Tesco is the uh, obviously strikingly distinctive mark. Well, the case that we have here is actually not uh, that dissimilar to, to, uh, to, to that uh, paradigm case. This is a situation where the uh, claimant's trademark is Eagle Rare. Rare, it is common ground, and the judge found, is a largely descriptive term, and, and my uh, laws will have noticed that um, the, the mark was registered with a specific disclaimer for the term rare, doubtless for that very uh, reason. The eagle is the uh, um, dominant and distinctive element of the uh, trademark, is clearly distinctive in its own right, and what the, the starting point would be, one would not expect another trader to be using a key mark of another uh, undertaking uh, at, at all. And so minor additions to it, uh, in this case additions such as American, which is true modified mark, uh, American Eagle, uh, to an extent, would not be thought to take that away from um, indicating that the goods came from the same trade source. 17b, uh, where the latter mark simply adds a non-distinctive element to the earlier mark, the kind which one would expect to find in a sub-brand or brand extension, Light Express Worldwide Mini. Again, the case here is not that dissimilar from that, because one thinks about the mark Eagle Rare, one thinks about the key dominant and distinctive feature of that, but the mark with which it's being compared is American Eagle. American, although it is not uh, strictly descriptive in every context, is a significantly descriptive uh, and not particularly distinctive uh, element in the context of American uh, whiskies. And third example, where the earlier mark comprises a number of elements, and the change in one element appears entirely logical and consistent with the brand extension. Again, there's a similarity there. So uh, if one thinks about the logic of the uh, uh, average consumer's thinking, it actually falls within the kind of contemplation uh, of uh, what is described as indirect confusion. One then turns to the next uh, case with, where this has been specifically considered in science on the other side, which is the Cheeky Indian uh, case. Uh, on page uh, 820 of the same bundle, uh, Mr. Miller, as he then was, um, explains that the likelihood of con indirect confusion is not a consolation prize for those who fail to establish a likelihood of direct confusion. Well, of course, that's right. What, what, what he's saying there is you, is you, you don't want to, to, to use indirect confusion as a sort of sweep up for saying, well, I'm not really sure there's any confusion at all but I'll give you a chance in relation to uh, uh, indirect confusion, which uh, is not afforded in relation to direct confusion. In 16.2, uh, he says 
Now, if, as here, the difference is between the marks as such that there's no likelihood of direct confusion, one needs a reasonably special set of circumstances for a finding of a likelihood of indirect confusion. And that's what Mr. Purvis was pointing out in those uh, uh, paragraphs. And in paragraph 16.3, when making a finding of a likelihood of indirect confusion, it's necessary to be specific as to the mental processes involved on the part of the average consumer. We respectfully submit that that is exactly what the judge found in this case. He found that there were circumstances not particularly special circumstances in that one would expect in the drinks market in particular uh, for there to be brand extensions, that uh, members of the public would naturally think that uh, the use of a common uh, sign of this kind, the specific kind, would denote goods from the same origin. And in relation to paragraph 7.63, uh, as my lords have seen, the uh, judgment went through the mental processes of the average consumer in meticulous detail, explaining exactly why, in the judge's view, he thought that they would be able to distinguish the products as different products, but nonetheless consider, on the basis of his evaluation of the marks as a whole and in the context in which they were presented, they would think that the goods came from the, from the same trade source. So what we have is a situation not of uh, applying an approach that is in any way divergent from that relating to the uh, 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 law on indirect uh, confusion, but is, is one that applies it in detail and, uh, with, uh, and with, um, with, with detailed reasoning. So can I come on to that in the uh, judgment and show uh, uh, you why the judge was uh, correct? Uh, if, if I can take that up at paragraph 57 uh, of the uh, judgment and, and go through it relatively briefly uh, in the light of the submissions made this morning, where the alleged errors are really of a very limited, uh, limited nature. So the, the judge starts out by uh, considering the nature of the respective uh, marks and signs. He does so entirely correctly in paragraph 59, where he says that the marks Eagle Rare uh, and uh, uh, e the mark Eagle Rare is two separate words, and he doesn't treat the mark uh, as if it were Eagle. Uh, rather than eagle rare. He treats it as the composite word, but he draws proper attention to the fact that rare has a particular role in the uh, mark as a whole uh, and uh, wouldn't be, uh, and would, would be uh, uh, read um, as referring to uh, the quality of the product or the kind of the product. Now, that's an entirely conventional way of analysing composite marks, where a mark may have a distinctive element, strongly distinctive element, and may also have a descriptive element uh, as part of it. So, right on that. Uh, he, he goes on to elaborate uh, that uh, point and uh, analyses uh, then the mark American Eagle uh, in the same way, uh, considering what the two elements are. Uh, he rejects the claimant's argument that the American is weak because it does more than the stately obvious. So he takes proper account of the nature of the uh, American eagle mark as a whole. He then undertakes the conceptual analysis in all respectful submission entirely properly. That hasn't been criticized in any way. He undertakes the oral analysis in respect of the similarity of the marks and considers that there's somewhat less than visual uh, similarity. He notes the uh, differences. He notes the evidence relating to the uh, fact that the uh, Eagle Rare mark is occasionally abbreviated. Uh, again, these are all matters that uh, a judge is entirely entitled to take into account how the mark is actually used and encountered in the, in, in, in the, in the public, uh, but by the public. He then does a, a detailed uh, 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 analysis if we've done a detailed analysis of that, he then steps back from that detailed analysis and concludes, in our submission entirely reasonably, that there is a significant degree of similarity, but not overwhelming uh, uh, similarity. He then takes into account the context in paragraph 64. And when I say context in this, in this context, he takes into account the circumstances in which the marks are likely to be encountered. That, again, is an entirely conventional way of uh, considering the context uh, of uh, uh, in, in trademark infringement. There is, of course, a more specific 
meaning that is, is sometimes uh, uh, discussed in the context of context, which is uh, how much one can take into account in, in a trademark case points uh, of the, where, where the defendant has said, well, I've got marks on my product, or there are ways in which the product is presented which mean that ultimately confusion is not likely. So points that are typically uh, considered in a passing off case. And um, my lord has uh, analyzed that uh, in, um, uh, in, in detail in comments on, on, um, uh, on the law, and, and Lord Justice Kitchen has commented on my lord's analysis. And uh, uh, in our respectful submission, there's no doubt uh, uh, that uh, in the context of trademark infringement, what one is considering is mark for sign. And it's not a defense in trademark infringement to say, well, I've got other indicia on my product which say uh, that uh, uh, the mark is, for example, the, the goods are, for example, not uh, genuine goods. I again, the judge. But we're not uh, considering that kind of scenario. Mr. No, Malinich doesn't say if there's a likelihood of confusion between the mark and the sign, I've got other indicia which negative that. That's not his case. No, no, I understand that. His, his case is that, is that there aren't positive indicia, effectively, which reinforce that. Uh, or he relies on the fact that, that, that there are, it is the absence of indicia which he says would exist if there was a brand extension. I think that's his point. On, on exactly. Context. And I'll, I'll come on to that in, 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 dealing, in dealing with context. Um, just before the uh, uh, adjournment, uh, so that the, the judge has, in, in our submission, entirely correctly uh, analysed the relevant context in which a mark would be uh, encountered, uh, and uh, then goes on to uh, analyse the um, uh, extent to which there would be confusion. And uh, if it's convenient, I can come on to 